Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. I've been told not to push this, um, so hopefully I won't get overly excited. Um, <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much, Fred, for those very kind uh, introductory remarks. Um, I'm always humbled and reminded about how uh, somewhat irrelevant these uh, platitudes and labels are. And my most recent experience was flying into, and I'm sorry if people have heard this already, but I got into New York, JFK, quite late uh, a few months ago. Around 11 o'clock, I was exhausted, really not in the mood to deal with immigration. Not that anybody ever is in the mood, but I walked up to uh, the immigration officer and they said to me, what is it exactly that you do? And I said with indignation, I'm an economist. And they said, you're a communist? <laughs> and so, of course, I said, no, I said I'm an economist. And she said, well, you don't have to say it like that. It's not like you were able to predict the financial crisis or anything. <laughs> so I stand here as a communist today. <laughs> Actually not, but um, anyway, my point just being that uh, these, sometimes these labels can get quite, uh, quite interesting. So um, thank you very much, uh, Marina um, and, uh, and Fred in particular, um, Robert as well, for hosting me this evening, excuse me, this evening, this afternoon, this evening somewhere in the world, um, <clears throat> and the lunch, and to all of you for being here this afternoon. I um, mentioned to Fred that uh, uh, I know that the title is uh, America's Hobson's Choice, but I got a few emails from a number of people, perhaps some of them here in the audience, saying, actually, we'd love to hear a little bit about uh, your arguments um, from dead aid. So what I'm going to do today, if you will permit me, um, is sort of put the title aside, um, American's Hobs Hobson's Choice, and really talk to you about both books, because actually there's a running theme uh, in my work, which is the idea of unintended consequences. And this is essentially the idea of good intentions. We want to help, um, but actually we end up with very bad economic outcomes. And this um, is between the two books. So what I'm going to do is spend a little bit of time talking about uh, uh, dead aid. And please, Fred, by the way, give me a wink if, I'm, if I start over-talking. I, I, I would love to hear people's feedback and questions. So um, uh, I hope at some point soon we can get into a dialogue. <clears throat> but let me start with dead aid. And then um, it, you'll see it it's rather seamlessly moves into my arguments and how the West was lost. So I want to start off by just saying that uh, with respect to the issues around aid and in, in particular around Africa and issues around economic development, I really want to emphasize that we are all on the same page. And I know that there's this sort of tendency to say, oh, that woman, she's against aid and I'm pro-aid, and to create, create this schism, which is very much a, a, an artifact or very much reflected in politics. Um, but I want to remind us all that we actually were all on the same page. And I'm going to give you three quick points that I think we all agree on. Um, the first point that we agree on is that it's it's neither desirable or sustainable for Africa to be dependent on aid to the extent that she's on aid, dependent on aid today uh, forever. And I think that should be the essence. We tend to forget that. We get sort of caught up with this idea of... Uh, of ha helping Africa, helping the developing world, we see, somehow seem to forget that actually, to put, uh, to put it as uh, President Kagame of Rwanda put it, the most successful aid is the type of aid that can help African countries, developing countries, get off of aid. So we have to remember that we really, really want to see Africa and Africans as equal partners on the global stage, and it's essential that um, Africa succeeds economically. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second important point that I think we all agree on is that we need African governments to lead the charge. It's absolutely important that African governments are the ones who are leading the debate, the policy um, innovation around economic development and policies um, across the continent. It's just not good enough if me as an individual from Zambia cares um, and my government doesn't care or African governments don't care. Um, it also doesn't matter if American individuals care about what's going on in Africa, but African governments don't care. And it certainly doesn't matter, as we are seeing now in the Middle East, um, it doesn't matter much if um, Western governments care about what's going on in these countries, but actually the governments um, uh, in these countries don't care. So we really need to get African governments to be incentivized to do the right thing where public policy is concerned. The third point, and I always say, is actually a point I'm stealing, completely plagiarizing from um, Minister Sonheim, the Minister of Foreign Development, International Development uh, in Norway. And people in the room might, who work in this area will be familiar with the fact that Norway gives about 1% of her income uh, in aid uh, to the, inter into, um, into the inter international aid. And um, <clears throat> I'd been invited to Oslo 
and had to have this debate. And I was quite surprised because I found this kind of odd. Why would a policymaker from a country that really obviously subscribes to the idea that aid is important, why would he want me to go there? But I did. We went to Oslo. And in a forum very much like this, mainly journalists, however, um, he and I, uh, Minister Sonheim, sat and had a debate about aid to Africa. And sort of midway through the discussion, the minister says, with his hands in the air, he says, you know, the fact of the matter is we need to accept that aid has contributed to the dysfunctionality of African states. And I honestly was stunned. And I said, minister, you're making my case for me. He said, well, it's something obvious. Everybody knows that African states have been, they have created a dysfunctionality by providing all this aid. And I'm, I'll come back to this point um, because I think it's quite important. But in essence, these are the three things I think we all agree on. We have to agree that we want, we want Africa to get off of aid at some point. We have to agree um, that uh, we want African governments to be incentivized. And we should actually agree that, you know, by and large, it has created a dysfunctionality. And whether that dysfunctionality is outright government stealing through corruption or simply an aid culture allowing African governments to abdicate their responsibilities of providing public goods, which, again, this is a point I'll come back to later, there's something inherently wrong with a system that allows, uh, um, allows African governments to be d rather dysfunctional. Um, what I wanted to quickly do here is just ex explain how I understand the evolution of aid to be. And here, by the way, we're not talking about uh, NGO aid or humanitarian aid. I think with humanitarian aid, there clearly is a moral imperative for us to help, whether it's floods in Pakistan or... Uh, something going on in a hurricane in um, Katrina or, um, or something happening in Haiti and so on. I think we should act as a global community. So I'm not talking about that, and nor am I talking about NGO aid, which is relatively small beer. I'm really talking about the billion-dollar packages that go as budgetary support to help uh, ostensibly help African governments. And really the essence and the origin of that type of aid is post Bretton Woods, 1950s, the success of the Marshall Plan really gave a lot of comfort and confidence to the international policymakers that aid would be a good idea. Um, and again, remember, this is the era of the two-gap model, the idea of if we put money into um, uh, into the economy, it helps with investment. Investment leads to growth. Growth re leads to poverty. And I all, reduction in poverty. And I actually always say, if I had been a policymaker or writing in the 1950s, I absolutely would have supported the idea of aid. Um, which is kind of interesting because my book was dedicated to Peter Bauer, who at that time was writing, and even at that time was very critical of the aid regime. And he subsequently, it turns out, was, was absolutely right to be, um, to be skeptical. But what was, what's really important is the reason why aid was so popular at that time is because, um, again, in the backdrop of the Bretton Woods and Marshall Plan, success of the Marshall Plan, there was a clear idea that if we could get aid monies, which were essentially placing domestic savings, into these economies, you would be able to increase growth and reduce poverty. And so in writing this book, Dead Aid, I really was focusing on, did, have we actually seen improvements in growth on a sustained basis, and have we actually seen a meaningful decline in poverty? Um, and I think the best uh, thing I could do is to quote Paul Collier, um, who was my PhD supervisor, but also has written a fantastic book called The Bottom Billion, when he said the problem is that Africa is now shearing off from the rest of the world. So the rest of the world is posting amazing economic gains. This was pre-financial crisis, but um, posting amazing gains, reducing poverty, and Africa is going in, in a different direction. And I don't, uh, we can talk about the data uh, if you wish, but I really want to um, link into the other, uh, the new book in a minute. So let me, let me push on, but we can talk about some of these issues. So what's the problem? Why is it that this good idea, this unintended consequence, good idea on paper, we want to help Africa, we want to give them money to reduce poverty, increase growth, why is it that in practice it hasn't worked? Well, a whole host of reasons, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and a lot of the literature, by the way, which I cite in my book is not literature that I've cooked up myself. A lot of the international agencies, World Bank, IMF, had written extensively about the inefficacies of aid, issues around fungibility, for example, Shanta Devarajan at the World Bank's written a lot about this issue. Um, but also, generally, there are a number of papers that have, have argued from the IMF and World Bank saying, you know, we shouldn't overplay what, what aid can do. And the biggest critiques are everything from um, the fact that it, leads, it, could, it has fueled and financed uh, corruption, issues around inflation, the debt burden, Dutch disease. I mean, there are lots of issues around that economically. 
But I would argue that the main problem with aid is that it actually severs the link between individuals and their governments. Um, and by that, I, it actually erodes the sanctity of a democratic contract that we uh, uh, actually all aspire to. So what do I really mean by that? Well, let's think for a moment how we live in the United States. Um, and I'm reminded of the Boston Tea Party, uh, no taxation without representation. There's a, a, the government taxes individuals in the United States, and in return, the government is supposed to provide um, the individual citizens with public goods. Things like education, health care, although I think most, mostly people outside of the United States think health care is a public good, but indulge me. Health care, education, uh, infrastructure, national security. And that's, that's the agreement. And if the government fails to deliver that adequately, you vote them out at the next election. Well, think about how it actually operates uh, in places like Africa, where actually the government spend a lot of time courting and catering, very rationally, I might add, um, courting and catering the donors, because the donors are the ones who actually fund a lot of these programs. Um, we're talking about, uh, on average, around 70% of uh, government revenues in African countries is financed by um, in, in most, most of sub-Saharan Africa is financed by, by aid, um, aid flows. So what you end up having is that the government is actually very rationally, as I say, focuses on the donors, and they really don't need to focus on being accountable to people on the ground. Um, Paul Collier and others have written about the fact that you end up with a lot of civil wars and instability because all the time you have factions trying to take over uh, um, sort of hold, take hold of uh, the state because that's where the, the cash flows are. Um, and so I really think that we tend to forget that there's this fundamental erosion of this contract which has essentially left Africa in a situation where a billion people represent less than 2% of world trade, 60% um, of the bottom 50 countries in the World Bank doing, survey, uh, doing business survey are African countries. African countries continue to you know, remain the mo amongst the most corrupt countries in the world, according to Transparency International, um, and, and, and um, there's uh, CPI, the Corruption Perceptions Index. There's still some very big structural problems um, that continue, and uh, one of the ones that I find really remarkable is the idea that there are about a billion people that go hungry every day on the planet. The highest proportion of them are in Africa, about 400 million highest proportion in Africa, and yet Africa is the continent that has the most untilled arable land. As an economist, I look at that, and that's a structural problem. And no amount of aid being used as a Band-Aid solution is going to fundamentally solve these structural problems that are obviously um, at the bottom, sort of bubbling under. So what we need to think about is providing the correct incentives to encourage African governments to do the right thing. Um, I should point out here that Two very quick things. One from one of the uh, leading donor agencies here. I think it's to be very obvious in a minute who I mean. Um, I had they called me and said, "Would you come for a meeting?" And I went and met met the head of the organization. And he said, "You know, the problem, Dambisa, is that you can say it because a lot of other people, because of political correctness, we're not in, we're not in a position to really critique aid, which I think is quite absurd in of itself. That we live in a world where something can be so dysfunctional, but we feel uncomfortable to point out when things have when there are issues. But the thing that really struck me was that um, this gentleman said, out of 50 countries in Africa, only two countries um, does the organization feel, or the international community, he said, the international community only feels comfortable to leave two countries to have their government write a report on any of the key sectors in the economy. So whether it's economics, education, health care, only two countries. And your guess is as good as mine. My guess was South Africa and Botswana. But, I mean, this is 50 years after independence. There's something implicitly wrong. And he went on to say that it's not because there are not Africans who are capable of writing these reports, but the very nature of the aid system means that governments abdicate their responsibilities of delivering these documents, and they absolutely rely on international agencies to do their HIV work or their education and so on. So this is a very, very dangerous place to be, particularly uh, as we think a lot about um, where the Western countries are with respect to their own budgets. But the second thing I want to just say very quickly was a comment from one of the recipients. I had spent a lot of time with a number of African presidents. 
And one of the African presidents said to me, you know, you have to understand, Ambisa, we're often portrayed as sort of, sort of semi-buffoons or idiots as African presidents. He goes, we're very rational. We understand that the more poverty, the more disease that we can show on paper, the more aid we receive. And, and he, he actually said to me that it's not that they don't understand this, but you have to understand that there's a whole infrastructure that is supporting this mentality. And a lot of the discussions around issuing debt in the capital markets, um, perhaps increasing your trade, focusing on regional integration, the things that other regions around the world have been doing, are not, they don't even feature in the discussions when um, donors are talking to uh, countries on the ground. And so we come back to this point of incentives. How do we incentivize African governments to do the right thing? And I'm going to come back to this issue of incentives after I spend a few minutes talking about this next book, um, How the West Was Lost. So as I said, the, the running theme between my two books is this idea of unintended consequences. And I got a lot of questions from my parents saying, well, why is it that you're writing this new book, How the West Was Lost? It doesn't really fit in with your last book. And I actually said it absolutely fits in. Because what you've seen over the last 40, 50 years in the United States in particular, but in Europe as well, is a systematic and deliberate uh, um, policy uh, approach which has implemented policy initiatives that I would argue have, again, good intentions, but actually are structured in such a bad way that you, they're eroding um, the three key ingredients that drive economic growth, which are capital, which is basically money, labor, the workforce, and um, productivity, how efficiently you can do things. And I apologize to the economists in the room because I'm sure it's a bit lowbrow for them. But the point just being that we know that there are policies, and I'm going to walk you through some examples of policies that have been instituted over the last several years that have led to this idea of this good policies, good ideas, good intentions, leading to a situation of economic problems that we face today. I don't really want to get into too much detail about um, debts and deficits. I mean, you only have to turn on the television to get, to get a, a sense of how desperate and how bad things are. It's whether it's the strikes in Europe, or um, the budget discussions that are going on in the US, I think people have a pretty good sense of what's going on. And in many ways, we're all to blame. I think that it's pretty clear that we've uh, all government and individuals over, uh, over consumed, borrowed money, and obviously um, the financial sector in particular, but the corporate sector as a whole has been complicit in, uh, in creating a derivative market and so on that actually was you know, un unfortunately unregulated. But if there's one thing that I think that policymaking has done, and if we think about the subprime crisis in particular, um, is that policymakers have, have in effect become portfolio managers. They've, they've started to pick for us what, a best, what the best asset class for our investments are. So government, to me, has three important roles. It's important for governments to provide public goods, as I mentioned a moment ago, things like infrastructure. It's secondarily important for government to create the right regulatory environment, not too much regulation that um, uh, incentives are killed off, but at the same time, the right amount of regulation, so bad behavior, uh, illegal behavior, and behavior that can have knock-on effects for the rest of the economy are not encouraged. And then the third thing is that government also should provide a policy environment that incentivizes people to do the right thing. Um, but also incentivizes people to be entrepreneurs or to create jobs, to invest, and so on. But if you just take the capital environment and subprime markets in particular, it's quite clear that through the housing for all policy, the idea that good intention, we want everybody to have a roof over their head, but through policies such as the low interest rate environment and through subsidies and guarantees through the um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, clearly we were incentivized to take our money and the government implicitly had chosen one asset class over another class, which was the housing sector, um, over bonds, stocks, commodities, and so on. It's an implicit decision, but it's also very similar to the decision that we see in the aid environment, where governments are essentially short um, the African markets because of they encourage this uh, idea of erosion of, uh, of a good policy environment. And that, to me, is implicitly a shorting of the, of the economies. In this particular case with subprime, what you've had is governments have, especially in the United States, have encouraged people to put their hard-earned earnings, uh, averaging over 30%, into the housing sector, which means that they absolutely lost out 
on the uh, globalization um, trade. They, they, most people didn't invest outside the United States. But also, the policy environment made the domestic policy look artificially attractive. Of course, the demographics helped as well, but fundamentally, there's something wrong with when the government creates an environment to artificially pick one asset class over another asset class. And I think this is something that absolutely happened in the United States. Um, I don't want to spend time, as I said, talking about debts and deficits and where I see that, because we can talk about that later. And in fact, the original um, headline, uh, the title of this presentation was going to talk about some of the choices that America faces now, and I'll leave that for the end. But I think it's really implicitly important for us to understand that this was a specific policy decision which was approved post-World War II by Democrats, by Republicans, housing for all policy, and it is absolutely um, part of the context that has led us with this situation that we've ended up with in the subprime. Um, somebody did say to me recently that it's quite unsurprising in many ways that the aid policy and policies around um, housing for all are, were actually made by the same people, if you think about it, because these are policy makers that have been, making, been, been made over the last 50 years. And I thought that was quite interesting because you know, they are the same policy makers in, in, um, by and large. If you think about the labor markets, also, uh, I won't spend time talking about pensions and health care costs because we all know about how bad those things are and, and also how little we really know about how big the problem is that we're facing. But once again, the pensions uh, policies are a classic example of a good intention going awry. Um, these are promises, and in finance we'd call them um, out-of-the-money options, promises that the government made, um, and also corporates made many years ago, that are simply now uh, expiring worthless, um, or will expire worthless if something is not radically changed. Um, in the book I call it essentially a Ponzi scheme, because we all know that it is the younger population, particularly at the federal and state level, that was expected to pay um, for, the, um, for the older generation, particularly at the federal level. Um, but there are other issues around pensions, which I think are very important, and which is the idea that we know also, and it's interesting because Marina from GM will be, I'm sure, quite familiar with this, but it added an additional layer of costs which forced business and strategy to change their approach um, to do how they do business. And obviously, this has led to uncompetitiveness, not just in terms of, our, of labor being uncompetitive, but business strategy itself being uncompetitive because there's this additional cost good intentions uh, leading to, to bad outcomes. And then let me focus very quickly on the, um, the productivity issue, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about incentives. How can we get governments to be incentivized to do the right thing? With respect to productivity, it, I would say it's a little bit more complicated. We certainly had the 1980s come along. Um, people like me would have been absolute supporters of the idea of free markets, free movement of not just trade and capital markets. I would also say um, <clears throat> I would be a big supporter of uh, movement of labor. <clears throat> but part of the uh, reason why people were so supportive of this idea of um, movement of, of trade and goods and so on in the 1980s was because there was an, an sort of implicit, in many ways explicit, expectation that all boats would float and it would be a better world for everyone. But if you look at the data, real wages have essentially been flat in Western countries, the United States included, and it's really forcing us to think, well, what exactly happened? Why is it that this good idea, let's all get together, we'll sell American goods internationally, and it will all be fine. Um, people in the, in the developing world will see improvements in their, their incomes. They'll want to buy American goods. Americans will have to produce more of those goods, and therefore their wages will go up. Why is it that now we're looking across and we have you know, 30 to 50 American, million Americans out of work in the manufacturing sector? Why is it that we look around and we see that real wages have been flat? So in other words, we haven't seen the benefits that we'd have expected. And some of the things I talk about in the book are, is this idea of platform companies. So there's almost been a, dis, a delineation between the people who are the holders of capital versus the people who hold labor. The people who've hold, held capital in the United States have by and large benefited. Um, and, and they're platform companies in the sense that they are trading on the New York Stock Exchange or um, in, on NASDAQ, but actually their operations are offshore, they're in, in other countries, their workforce is offshore, and therefore if you were a shareholder in those companies, you would have seen gains. Um, but the holders of labor um, actually have seen, had a very different experience. As I said, not only have their wages been flat, um, but we know also that they had most of their investment in their houses, which we know now in retrospect that the, the values of those houses have gone down, 
And in addition, these country, these uh, individuals have been left with masses of debt. And so it's very hard to explain to people how it is this idea of being open uh, could have been beneficial. Now, I'm, uh, as I said, I'm a big believer in integration, free trade, and so on. But the reality is that we know that this doesn't really work uh, in practice. And clearly, as the government made one asset class look attractive, uh, the housing, uh, housing market, it didn't just make it look attractive um, from a domestic portfolio perspective, but also it made Americans invest in the domestic housing market over investing internationally. Um, there's been some interesting work out of the University of Chicago, Zingales, for example, Professor Zingales has written a lot about um, the comparison of the 1950s and 1980s when the U.S. was quite closed, comparing that to the 1980s to 2007 when the U.S. has been quite open. And he finds that GDP growth is about 2%, 2.1% in both times. Um, the, the, as I just said, these, there are people who are holding capital, the higher um, wealthier uh, population in the United States have seen their incomes grow three times, only about 10% for people at the lower incomes. And I think a lot of um, the arguments that he lays out um, very much fit into what I'm saying here, which is this idea of these platform companies, people who are uh, holders of capital, have seen um, greater benefits than people who just hold labor. And again, it's rooted in this idea of good intentions, globalization, a good idea, but badly implemented ends up with where we are now. Um, let me just spend a few minutes talking about this idea of incentives and talk a little bit about some of the things that I, I find quite interesting um, in the debate right now. So clearly in these two scenarios, the dead aid and the how, how the West was lost scenarios, the running theme that I think is problematic is that we have governments and policymakers that are incentivized to do the wrong thing. Um, you know, it's everything that I've said is sort of dr driven by good intentions, things that look good on paper, but actually as a practical initiative um, yield a bad economic outcome. And the question, I mean, I think in places like the United States where you have hyper-politicization, you've got elections every two years, I think there's something to be said about governments being way too focused on short-term tactical issues, very rationally, as we know, um, and not enough focus on longer-term structural issues. So they might be focusing on deficits, incredibly important, but it's almost at the expense of issues around education, around uh, infrastructure, around uh, energy efficiency, some of the biggest structural problems that the United States and the world will be facing um, as a whole. So then the question, and, and very similarly, you could say that it's, it's actually quite similar in, in places across Africa where democracies, there are illiberal democracies, um, and very often the government are focused on short-term rewards. I want to get the money in now from the aid, um, or have somebody do my work, um, but are actually not incentivized to sort out longer-term um, problems. So the question then becomes, how can we incentivize governments to do, to do this? And I'm not by in any way saying they need to become autocratic and, hey, look at China. I'm not saying that at all, because I do think within the democratic framework, we see examples of countries that have longer um, political terms. Mexico is an example, six-year terms. Um, but even if that doesn't work, and I think that there's, I can see that there be a lot of resistance to changing constitutional terms in, in the United States and so on. There's a lot of discussion now about conditional transfers, which I think is quite interesting. I wrote a lot about this in Dead Aid, um, and uh, it, it's worked quite interestingly in, in Brazil and Mexico, and we're, there's a discussion now um, happening across Europe, and, and the idea is very simple. It kind of goes like this, and I should point out, actually, Michael Bloomberg has started a, a pilot program, has been running a pilot program in New York, also um, running with this running theme of conditional transfers. But the idea is basically to pay people or reward people with cash for doing the right thing. Um, your child goes to school, great attendance record, 98% attendance, you give them $100 or something like this. Uh, your child gets inoculated, you get $100. Um, but what's, what's actually happening across Europe now, and one of the discussions is that because we all know and recognize that we need people to go and study sciences and mathematics, it's really important for innovation longer term, in order to incentivize people to do that, we might pay them, not just in credits, but in actual cash to get their kids to go to school. Now, this is obviously a hot potato because do we really want to live in a society where we actually have to start to pay people to do things that we think should, they should be doing anyway? Um, but these are the things that are actually now on the table, um, particularly because I would say people like me absolutely um, need, believe that we need the United States, we need European countries, to get it right, because a lot of the big issues that the world is going to be facing in 2050 with 9 billion people, 
issues around resource scarcity, particularly in water and arable land and energy and so on, we really need innovation and technology to be invested in that. And unfortunately, um, or fortunately in some sense, but unfortunately it, it really does fall on the United States to a large extent to lead the charge. You still are the most uh, innovative and advanced economy around technology and R&D, um, but if you look at the OECD PISA statistics or the TIMS trends, it's quite worrying reading um, about how much, uh, it, how much not investment in capital terms, but in terms of actual quality investment there is uh, in mathematics and sciences and reading, um, not just for the U.S., but also across Europe, and how, how much over such short, such short periods of time, like a decade, um, performance has declined so rapidly. So ultimately, to me, it's all about incentives. It's about getting government to be incentivized to do the right thing. Um, quite clearly, we're in this very bizarre uh, malaise economically, both in places like Africa, but across the West right now, where our policymakers are very rationally being rewarded for focusing on short-term, low equilibrium outcome, outcomes, when actually the problems that we face going forward are much longer term and much more structural. Um, thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you.